Hello everyone, today we talk about Carolingian heavy infantrymen and therefore we will concentrate chiefly on, you know, say equipment, training, morale, things like that um, to stereotype a category that is difficult to frame from a conceptual point of view in the sense that at this time uh, we're talking chiefly about, you know, 9th century, maybe, you know, second half of the 8th um, that, that is fundamentally mixed with the same rise of mounted combat. As you know that basically Carolingian warfare is characterized chiefly by the beginning of the development of a professional mounted elite that very gradually uh, starts emerging from, let's say, a, a migration era context where surely mounted combat was an important thing but at the same time it wasn't so collectively um, uh, practiced and you know um, disciplined as it would come later and that um, in fact eventually would lead to the emergence especially during the 10th century what properly we we call chivalry the militia as a um, uh, as a properly as a, as a military class that well, open to what we call as feudalism, and more in general, this enormous that reflects this enormous concentration of wealth in the hands of very few people. And we have explained that there is a, a playlist about Carolingian Europe that uh, that's pretty hefty. But you know, recently we we didn't we didn't talk about that from 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 some time now. I think from last summer, possibly even. Um, and it, it's it's kind of even you know the, today's video. Sh will touch certain aspects that I'm surprised we still haven't discussed previously because Carolingian warfare is really important, right? And especially from a conceptual point of view. Um, this lack, this this is probably the greatest characteristics of Carolingian, the Carolingian war, the lack of a public culture. I mean, the idea that these a Central European power that managed to extend its control from on, on a huge area and fun fundamentally compete uh, with with the Roman Empire, and uh, even assuming basically the Romanity of of, of its own, uh, all here here it, it doesn't matter now to, to discuss the issue that we did elsewhere about the Romanzo Imperium and so on, but um, it was devoid of a statal nature. Like it was based practically exclusively on private clienteles. This is something very difficult to understand uh, in modern terms because. We live in states, right? And there were other places in Europe that were properly, you know, structured more in a more central uh, form. The Carolingians didn't have that. And that was, paradoxically, the gluing factor that, with the, stemming from the vassalitic beneficiary system, that kept not the empire together, because you know how it ended. Um, the St. Carolingian Empire is somewhat uh, an accident in many ways, from a dynastic accident, you know, the, the permanence of a dynastic continuity, uh, in a say, or better, the concentration of power in the hands of a single heir for two generations, so we're talking fundamentally about Charlemagne, and, and the lead appears, naturally, uh, Charles Martel and Pippin the Shorthand also um, uh, ach uh, achieved that unity uh, before, but still the Franks never learned how the thing was. You know, they always split their possessions uh, at every generation among the male sons, so everything was uh, all over again, right? So that was the lack, if you want, uh, for Europe, because the legacy of the Carolingian Empire is massive uh, in, in many ways, from this military point of view especially, because the Franks were best uh, at one thing compared to other. it was that was war, right? Professional clientels of mounted uh, warriors that were taking that sense an ever more collective um, uh, discipline and training and you know efficiency at that point. Because as you know here, maybe you gradually lose the individualistic capacity, individual capacity of a migration era. Uh, a cavalryman, right? Never think you are more intelligent or m or more capable. I don't know than a than a Bulgar horseman of of the of the seventh century. Um, but at the same time, you know that speaks for a rel well. Okay, Bulgars were something else compared to this context, of course, and they they definitely had a collective training was higher than other peoples in Europe. But I mean, never think that the tribe, the warrior, the individual, is a declaration of strength. If anything, it's a declaration of military weakness. 
And we evolved as a civilization because we abandoned the idea that one can do everything because it, it can't. And that not only, but two can do more than two singles together. They can do three, they can do four. That's the basic combined arms is that that means having a, acquiring a political, strategical culture and being a, a, a civilization uh, worth of this name, you know, if, you know, whatever that means at some level. But it, the, the Carolingians are the ones to trigger this in a brutal way because the empire was definitely the, based on expansion, on submission, but we, on subjugation, and on sla- um, you know, slavery, on, on something that today we cannot understand from a moral point of view, but still there was an effort from, you know, enlightened rulers such as Charlemagne, Louis the Pius, especially to to create something that could survive that uh, contingental, you know, private combina- you know, um, coincidence of interests uh, for external expansion that and that which would fail, but would leave important trace in the church in the, in the uniforming of administration of script that would create a Europe, right? The three main Carolingian kingdoms: the Western Frankish, the Eastern Frankish, and the Italic uh, kingdoms um, were largely what you know, Europe in in a unitary sense stemmed from, right? Because previously, you know, this, this Frankish element came to encompass eventually in the following centuries parts of Spain, eventually with the Norman conquest of England, and eventually the Western Slavs, and beyond, right? So in Scandinavia. So this is the, the world, in a sense, from which we come from as Europeans in a unitary sense, which before didn't quite exist uh, conceptually. So... Charlemagne, father of Europe, in a sense, yes, it's no, Europe wasn't made just like that, but that definitely gave an orientation that would be expanded on further, and that brought especially to an important degree of homogeneity in Europe that previously uh, didn't quite exist on, on certain grounds, at least as l- later on. Uh, why do I say this? Well, because for today's topic, um, that is looking essentially at, at the elite. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where we, why we can't distinguish too much between cavalrymen and, and infantrymen in that regard. But we are looking at something that would fundamentally spread as a model pretty much everywhere, right? Because if you... Uh, today we'll look a lot at, at equipment, but if you really had to, I don't know, confrontate this point from, from an armament point of view, I don't know... Um, a Carolingian commerce with a, I don't know a Langobard uh, dux or uh, you know but you wouldn't um, you wouldn't see the, this dramatic difference right it's not the equipment to make the difference it's really the fact that you could have this larger masses of troops um, um, let's say for for those time standards of elite troops I mean that that could have a collective training. And it's more difficult in this sense to give a touch of, let's say, uh, of ma- uh, let's say, a, a foot combat to it, because the direction here was overwhelmingly towards towards mounted warfare, which in that sense was more effective, especially with collectively trained practice, and but naturally ex- existed also on foot. It's just that the guy who had enough uh, wealth to afford uh, a full, you know, here by heavy infantrymen would basically mean. Somebody with a with a with a metal armor, right? Um, usually the, the complete one, but also some. You know, if you already had some pieces of it in the eighth century, in the ninth century, it was a big deal, right? And that therefore they could afford two horses, right? And often a, a lifetime spent on uh, training on combat and mounted combat, and we will see how. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Sometimes we're actually talking about the same people, mm-hmm. and even here differences. Uh, the Carolingians are fascinating because if you look at the essentials of of their panoply, you you realize not much had changed from from Roman times. Uh, also, if you look at I don't know the Normans as would arrive later, still fundamentally of Western Frankish copy because that's all they were. Um, they they also didn't have a dramatically different equipment, so. It's it's not about the technological dimension, but the, the political, the social one, right? Who who was the elite that ruled this world? Who could afford to spend to sp- to spend a, a lifetime on horseback? That means thousands of people breaking their backs in the fields to provide for them. And this is Car- the Carolingian world in a nutshell. 
right? Privatization at its highest, like you see in no other place in Europe. Because gold was, in, you know, was, was fundamentally the place that had, hadn't seen a, a, a dramatic break uh, with the, the late antiquity and the latifundi. Right, they, these the, this Gallo uh, Roman uh, Frankish elites had fundamentally maintained in their hands largely those estates that, that would make even an average, um, you know, uh, small Gallic lord sometimes even richer in terms of land than I don't know a Longobard king, and and that means that that is why that was a private world because it was based exclusively on the. You know that no force could eradicate these people from 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 their own land, right? That there was some, the Carolingians worked especially to recover uh, lands being usurped by by the great ecclesiastical lords, especially also in southern Gaul, etc. Um, it's a very complicated thing. We'll talk about another time, right? But that was fundamentally still based on military call entails. The Carolingians started mo mostly from uh, Austrasia, as you know, they were Austrasians them themselves, um, and they they also encountered other military systems that functioned differently and that kind of hybridized eventually, and or, you know, influenced in turn partly the Carolingians as well. So the Carolingian Empire was very varied. At some point we will see also the broader characteristics of uh, the Carolingian military. I think we already made a video on that, uh, but we, we should expand on it. Surely we will make another video specifically on the, let's say, the evolution of, um, let's say, yeah, I mean, a Frankish, um, a Frankish panoply, um, in 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 um in the sense of you know, in parallel to the development of cavalry and, uh, you know, shock tactics and something that historians maybe have put too much emphasis on how did they develop the thing. It was all very gradual. Cavalry has always done basically the same things, right? The fact that they would prefer more the couché lengths, uh, charge uh, style, but it's something that, you know, it, that always existed historically in every context. Like, uh, cavalrymen have always fought literally with, any possible kind of grip and in all historical times. It's just that in some, they, they would specialize more in one, especially collectively, as we've seen before, to be more or less effective. And this is still a time in which there is a lot of hybrid there. And, and that's what makes it fascinating. Um, we speak of infantrymen, not of cavalry today, to stress also another point that I personally care about because it, it's meaningful in, in, in the history of, of European warfare, that is, how long, ma uh, let's say, foot combat remained as, as a, you know, as the, as a viable option, even for the, for the mounted elite, right? There, there are some areas, even that were encompassed by the Carolingian Empire, that for centuries would still not necessarily prefer foot combat, but, you know, would have it very frequently, like for example, especially the Eastern Frankish Kingdom in Germany up to the 12th century was very common, and it's not up to that time that in fact Western Frankish feudalism would be completely adopted. So we're talking about very different realities. I made a video last summer about the Carolingian conquest of Saxony, um, what was the deal there, uh, how those troops felt, and, and therefore, and always considered that in this Carolingian Empire, at, at the apex of its, its might, um, the subject communities, so with all their kind of local, you know, traditions, uh, traditional military, you know, styles, to call it in this way, but they weren't dramatically heterogeneous, were called to fight uh, in the Carolingian army. So you would find, I don't know, Saxons fighting in Spain, uh, you know, Longbirds fighting in, in, in Germany, all, all this stuff that, um, that actually tells you a lot also about the the enormous amount of, of influences that existed also in in, in Europe still so this time from areas like the East, chiefly, very especially evident in in, in armor, in, in arms. That, that that's where most military developments would come from. At the same time, also a specific um, you know feature of Carolingian warfare that emerges that is mounted combat and also important developments in metallurgy that at that point were mostly concentrated in the in the Rhine land. Not not only though. Um and they were exported all over. Like the Franks here are the great 
exporters of military culture that is imitated by everybody, by the Western Slavs, by the by the Vikings, by the Anglo Saxons, by uh, by the Italians, by the Spanish, but ba basically by everybody, right? And because they were the dominating power in Western Europe uh, along those patterns, so. Um, it goes without saying that just the richest could afford complete arms and armor. Mm -hmm. Carolingian society, as we've seen, worked with this prof uh, professional warriors uh, armed largely already at this point by uh, by their own patrons. Mm -hmm. So here we already find, like, um, um, let's say, an autonomous military organization. The Carolingians didn't quite invent anything new. Uh, they were just working with what were already existed, and as we've seen, especially in gold, those clientels, especially of mount, with you know of lords with mounted retinues, were already able to do that since a long time, since late Roman times. Let's be honest. Um, and uh, other men like levies instead were kind of had to make it on their own with what they could acquire. Right to do here, we will not discuss. We will do. We'll have to do an enormity of videos on Carolingian military organization, especially because what strikes you actually about Carolingian warfare more than else is what they could put together lo logistically speaking. Right, that there were certain expeditions, such as the ones to against the other Canate on the Danube, or the ones across the Alps uh, against the Longobards that were pretty damp, you know, that tells you the, the magnitude, the scale of Carolingian resources at the time, and the great plan, like Charlemagne, even just in this context, I mean, uh, you can't have in the 8th century, uh, you know, a great military sophistication in the first place, so surely there were Hannibals and Scipios in, in here, um, but they couldn't emerge properly, So, but the, what emerges the, the most, Charlemagne embodied it perfectly, is the logistical capacities, the, 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 the organizational ones that could shift this enormous amount of men uh, with, with enormous uh, costs and supplies and so on with this capillary organization of the various lands and you know the various duties requirements that, that's something we'll see uh, some, uh, at some other point. Um, we know for example I don't know uh, the Domesticus Dodo right look as one of the most powerful figures in the Carolingian state could equip his followers with hauberks, helmets, shields, lances, swords, bows, and arrows. Never underestimate the fact that these guys, uh, since the migration era, po possibly even before, were all horse archers, potentially, right? That, that they wouldn't fight preferably like that, but it would be regularly equipped like that. And, and the fact that eventually uh, this warfare specialized in, he in shocked heavy cavalry, shock tactics, doesn't mean that uh, uh, horse archers did not exist, aside from the fact that we have direct evidence of them. But it it's, it's obvious because this man, especially the nobility, and therefore exactly the elite, if they didn't fight, they were spend, you know, they, they were hunted. Right in their in, in their lives, and it, it's a bit all the same because uh, literally hunting a human being or an animal is you know, any other animal is literally you know what's the difference, um, and uh, they knew how to to use. Uh, but since Merovingian time, I mean it, th th that should be understood as pretty standard in in West in Western Europe. Right, we're not talking of the obvious of the East where horse archery was much uh, was widespread. But in the West, it had been like that. And you would be surprised even how much in Roman times that, that, that thing was true. Um, naturally, with the due proportions, like, you know, there the weren't uh, armies like the ones of the steppes. But surely the influences had been, been very, very important, right? The steppes ended basically at the gates of Germany. And don't, don't, devour, don't underestimate, I don't know, the, the, the capabilities of, I don't know, the, the influence of the Avars, of the Bulgars, that at this point did, did reach far in, in the West. Uh, at some levels, it would continue on. Think about the hungers in the you know the, the nine, ten centuries, um, and the, the there was naturally a duty uh, to participate to the to the imperial arm, and uh, or to the royal one because uh, here also the, the there were different ways of, of of asking for you know for military duty. Uh, for political reasons that that already existed probably from centuries, but maybe that get documented in certain contexts at least now, like you know, um, you know, out of mm, at this point there was still the hair band, where theoretically all the subject, the free men had to to participate to the army, 
but factually, just even for the sake of um, uh, agricultural production, not everybody could leave home. So obviously, just like I don't know, a person in four would um, receive from from all the four, you know, the, the, from from the others the uh, a part of their resources so that he could go fully supplied and therefore you know and armed and, and useful militarily wise while the others would remain home you know creating resources for 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 next expeditions because Carolingians um, are famous essentially for the fact that they made campaigns every single freaking year like in the ecclesiastical annals the big news was not the military expedition, but whether there hadn't been a ex military expedition that year, sometimes there been multiple times, especially when the the empire was at the largest. So it was always like that, and and the wall system uh, uh, f fundamentally expanded like it. And as long as it, you know, that there was somebody else to conquer, outwardly uh, the, the the empire you know, stood on its feet. Eventually, it didn't crumble for any particular reasons, like the second invasions uh, were, I mean, externally, the second invasions were just a consequence of internal Carolingian collapse, not the cause of Carolingian collapse. And um, and that's also another story that, that is often gotten wrong, at least in popular perspective, because historiographically we know pretty well how things happened, but let's say that um, it, it's all about internal politics and how that world already was and wasn't changed dr dramatically at the moment by, by Carolingian rule and that, that's one of the consequences um, speaking of the manufacture of, of weapons this was largely localized in that world where there weren't dramatically developed uh, international traffics but something was emerging as we said before the, the Orion line was Perhaps the most important, um, uh, you know, weapon uh, and armor um, manufacturer production, but surely certain er uh, certain areas, especially in Italy, uh, in cities such as Lucca and Pisa, where mm, uh, armory man production might have survived from, from Roman times, right? Eventually, it was Lombardy to raise in the following centuries as the main uh, European center of armory production. But still, probably those were you know important uh, areas. It also, important you know the most important traffics and you know resources of avail availability was was there, and we know also because these centers, I mean from Europe, uh, why why this you know Frankish area, were ex exported arms and armor, also to non-Christians, pagans, Muslims, right? Um, this is mostly even I don't know if you think I don't know, Carolingian manufacturer was. Ex Arm, arms and armor were exported to, to, to the pagan Germans, to the Slavs, to the Danes. This thing would go on even during the Viking era, right, where these guys, the, you know, the, the, the Normans were hitting hard uh, the same goal. But they, they still traded locally, uh, especially with, also with these elites that were military ones, as we've seen. Uh, the Italians mm, exported uh, in the Mediterranean their the weapons, uh, Pisa had flourishing um, commerce with Muslim nor North Africa and the East. Uh, the papacy had something to say that, albeit at this time it was still the Jewish merchants that had, you know, the upper hand in the Mediterranean, and those were largely from from the Muslim side. Um, but uh, as we were saying before, the Franks had uh, the, the broader the Frankish world broadly meant, as you understand here. Um, was the best in in in, arm, in arms and armor production. If you look at the, uh, cal, uh, you know the 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 exchange uh, the gifts, diplomatic gifts exchanged between Charlemagne and the Caliph of Baghdad, you would see the Muslims exporting you know com complex, sophisticated technologies, water clocks, and all this stuff. What would the Franks export? Horses and swords, right? You know, it would get you know, um, and and that. That's we could say were were they all about that? Well, fundamentally, yes, right. The, you know, in their their minds, that 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 was the only possible horizon because these guys literally, you know, had an empire because they spent their time on horseback fighting against other peoples. That's the only thing, and they did it masterfully, right? Um, so, um, as we were saying before, th there were, however, influences received uh, military influences received, especially from let's say. Um, I would say both the Byzantine and the the steppes area, 
Mm? The, this broader inf Pontic influence, we, we could say, that would last until the 11th, 12th century, importantly in Western warfare, and that would parallel it in, in some sense, because uh, at this point also the Byzantine military was uh, reawakening after the so-called, you know, let's say the contraction after the the collapse of late antiquity. Um, so there was, you know, for, for uh, up to the 12th century, let's say, there was a balance like that. Eventually, the Western nurse would take over, at least on, on those areas. And um, but um, there was, in the sense, a competition, yes, but also an exchange, a meeting ground. And there were important influences to be found here and there in that sense. Uh, like the, the, the heaviest equipment you can imagine in this sense could be, you know, uh, the one described for Charlemagne at, at the siege, uh, you know, in front of, of Pavia in 773 AD. It was the largest siege in, in Carolingian warfare, um, uh, written by a monk of St. Galen. Right, in the famous monastery. It says, Thus appeared the Iron King, well, of course, in translation, his crested iron helm, in Latin, Ferrea Galea Cristatus, so crested with the, this iron helm, with sleeves of iron mail, Ferreis Manicis Armillatus, on his arms, his broad chest protected by an iron burning, uh, the, the Brunia, the Ferrea Torace Tutatus, right? So, you get here the helmet, then there is a coat of mail, and over it the brunia. It was fundamentally this, as we've seen. There is a bit of because there, there is no surviving archaeological evidence of that, but you know some iconographic ones. But we, we're pretty sure they exist. We we are not cent for cent sure like how they were made up. In spite they would spread, we know it from from written sources. Like the terminology was there, it would be adopted by. I mean, I don't know, the, the, the long birds, the, the, the Scandinavians. Uh, this thing, as we're saying, were exported broadly by, from, from the Franks. Um, but it, it's like a bit, let's say, in the Byzantine world, right? This idea of, uh, here we're talking about a ultra-heavy equipment for, for the emperor, right? So for something that the, 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 the average trooper would never have. And, and even the, for the elite, started costing a lot, right? Also... The monk adds an iron lance and an iron mail for his tigs uh, as well, hmm? which was fairly rare. Like um, the, the 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 king's iron spear had reinforcement or boss of his shield are maybe an exaggeration. Um, but uh, here it's important to stress that, th that there are parallelisms with other cultures in these different layers of armor. For example, this would be fine in the Byzantine era, right? Most Franks would. Actually, don't have I don't know this this extra you know this mail covering their thighs because they would uh, normally spring um, uh, more quickly upon their their steeds. Thus, right. So um, being more or less armored that by itself doesn't mean much. Like it depends what kind of trooper you are, what you have to do, what what's your deal, right? So uh, the heavier you get, the most expensive it gets, but also literally the the heaviest it becomes physically and therefore uh, you know. If, if everybody's equipped like that in a unit, you know, that, that unit is probably elite, but you can't in employ it all the time, just mostly in reserve, and or you know, tiring more easily, and having, therefore, less uh, deployability in practice. Um, so, mm, the average um, heavy cavalryman, say, by the mid-8th century, as um, we can't read from the loaves of the Ripuarian Franks, would have a helmet, a brunia, a body armor, sword, scabbard, leg defenses, lance, uh, shield, uh, and, and naturally horse, right, as the full equipment of the horseman. As we were saying before, naturally, these guys dismounted to fight. Um, the price of all this panoply would be 44 solidi, and consider that a peasant cow would be worth uh, 3 solidi. So, um, that gives you a measure of you know the the broader cost uh, of this, and probably things had not changed much from the eight, the seventh century. Even right, this was a very grad, gradual, you know, um, oligarchization of society, but still evident in, in the measure in which the Carolingians managed to channel uh, to channel it, its resources into the military, in, in into mil collective military activity, and. Uh, a large proportion of Carolingian mounted men would have lacked, however, consistent armor. Mm -hmm. um, they their equipment was lighter to and costing 
let's say only two solidity of of armor uh, and twelve for the horse. So the aforementioned forty four tells you how much those guys were instead loaded and in armor and how that proportionally cost it even just to the mount. It's really a lot, enormously. Uh, here we're talking about very delicate, fragile socioeconomical systems, right? And they, they, in order to uh, to create an armor, we'll see that it, you know there was a, a huge amount of resources, and you couldn't substitute, you know, rep- reproduce them quickly, right? So um, this also speaks for the general reawakening of European economy at this time, because by the the, the, the I don't know, seventh century having such large numbers of finding Carolingian armies um, repeatedly employed every year would have been prohibitive and damaging for, for the same economy. Um, we will probably make a video on heavy archers. That used to say we, we see mostly um, archery r- remaining uh, in Carolingian warfare uh, from, from previous times and developing further. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, we know that infantry was initially equipped with bows, right? The, the various prescriptions of you know equipment all over Western Europe were about you know if you if you didn't have enough enough money f- uh, enough pr- you know wealth to 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 have a spear and a lance were basically the, the standard uh, equipment for the average soldier. You would have to be equipped with bow and, and quiver. Right, and don't underestimate uh, the the mass of of these foot archers because they they were quite effective in their own regard. Um, however, what happens during Carolingian times is that the the increased uh, heaviness of cavalry um, renders these lighter troopers fundamentally ineffective. Right, it's a matter of of, of discipline. Yes, these were the rabble of you know the, the peasantry. Um, the discounts is that they couldn't put together kind of a dramatic resistance against you know very concentrated bodies of heavily armored cavalrymen, right? And throughout this time, uh, in the in the following, especially during the 10th century, there would be other uh, weapons developing for countering cavalry, um, such as you know pikes, uh, also the long hafted so-called Danish axe. That, however. Um, just like the Francisca in the previous centuries, do not seem to have come from the north at all, right? These were, the Francisca seems to have actually been created by the Romans and eventually been adopted by the Germans. The same goes for the so-called Danish axe, it was called like that, actually it seemed it was developed in the Carolingian world, right, and eventually adopted by others. And the reason being that these um, weaponry uh, was designed for for a warfare against, let's say, um, armor troops because that's what you need uh, i mean the pike against cavalry chiefly but you know weapons with such a traumatic force and uh, penetration capability like the, the, the double handed uh, axe are something you, you need essentially to break through a, a code of mail right so um the the vikings start using these things because also they gradually start having their elites more you know affording more equipment but essentially that's something that would naturally emerged from a much more armored context like the Carolingian one that was engulfed since, you know, the mid-9th century from continuous civil wars and that uh, would create the need for for such equipment. So um, that, that is a common misconception, actually. Um, but uh, it seems it seems like that. They consider, because as always, it's like the Romans. What, what was the greatest enemy of the Romans? Other Romans, right? <laughs> what was the greatest enemies of, of the Carolingians? Other Carolingians. And these guys were all armored. So that's where, where the, the need to, to develop also such more heavily, you know, uh, traumatic weapons to, to use effectively against armor. As we were saying before, uh, speaking of armor uh, and the Brunia, specifically the Berni, um, we we have no idea how it actually was made of. Like we some say of scales because it appears here and there. Uh, others say it's, it was a male uh, hauberk. Others say you know there were pieces of horn. Also because the terminology r- remains for centuries afterwards, and we know that there was a mix of all these things. Uh, some was uh, leather uh, or fabric uh, armor with, you know, pieces of iron, bronze, or horn uh, in, inserted in. I mean, um, there was a variety of that. Um, and it, however, it, it's meant to be essentially a, a chest armor, 
Right. Uh, we see even uh, it's a, a bit like as we were saying the the Byzantines, the the Torakas or Zaba. The, 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 think about the Klebanian specifically um, that was worn sometimes over. Uh, like uh, like over mail in 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 Byzantine cavalry, uh, lamellar armor uh, was also known in Italy at this time, uh, not just in the Byzantine held areas. And we, I mean, I personally, I think lamellar armor still was not widespread, but still you know it existed in some meaningful quantity. I don't know, even in Anglo-Saxon England and in Scandinavia, famously enough, also. In the latter case, think about all the the Eastern Asian influences in places like Sweden, especially. So, um, this is not so strange at the end of the day. Think about also the Spanish mark, the the the, the, the Muslim frontier. Um, this stuff did exist. It's just we don't have a direct evidence for for this, uh, archaeologically speaking, for this context, right? So, um, here we we will not comment. I mean. The scale armor is to be found in Western Europe, very b much better documented in the later in, in the following centuries up to the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, think of the bro of, at the idea that literally the steps ended as we were saying before in Germany. Like Germany up to the 13th century had still the, the Draconis standards. They, they, they were very wild areas that were influenced by these Eastern raiders. Um, and um, and so the Scandinavians were at the time, like the Merovingians back in the day had to to cope with uh, with other invasions uh, in Germany. Uh, later on, famously, the, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom was ravaged by the Hungars, mainly with their their favorite uh, target, whereas Gaul was mostly targeted by the Vikings and Italy by the Saracens. Um, but actually, they hit all, in, in all places all the three of them. Um, so that tells you how blended and mixed uh, that military culture could be and it would always remain because if you consider how eventually 10th 11th century warfare developed you know it was not very far from Carolingian times it were mostly all the same peoples and uh, we know they toured around and uh, and as we were saying before the, the same Carolingian empire gave that um, you know as, as a broader was supposed to be a universal empire you know it brought together people coming from everywhere and, uh, and especially also the elite. So sometimes, so the, the ones that that, that could, that they had the highest military knowledge and expertise. We find I don't know, aside from the Scara, uh, the Scara that, that you know were you know, pre but I don't know. We know of uh, ducal Longobard um, contingents sent as far as as, as Germany as we were saying before. Um, so you understand how much. You know how far-ranging such uh, military expeditions uh, were, and how much broader organization uh, could could invest these this various areas uh, in common. Um, there is also some question of whether quaff or head, like ham and tail, um, could could have been introduced, especially through our influence with the. The, the Central Asian tradition surviving in parts of the Pannonian Plain. Um, we see male crafts uh, also in, in uh, early Christian and Jewish sources from Roman Italy and Syria. Um, at this point, the up to this point, the, the Spangenhelm that was of, of Asian origin had fundamentally had dominated uh, f for a long time. Um, and at this point, the, um, there were also some modification in the standard helmet. We find there's also the question in in all the... Uh, we, we find this... It's complicated, right? Think of the iconographic evidence of the kind of romanizing look of Carolingian troops uh, that we find in manuscripts, illuminations, chiefly. Uh, that was probably a poetic license for saying that, of course, the Carolingians were the new Romans, that therefore that legitimized their power. We don't find much of that, for example, solid form uh, of helmet copied from from classical um, sources that we find in these illuminations in, in archaeological form. Um, so we think it might have been invented, but still we can't be fully certain. I mean, areas like you know, the salad would emerge chiefly from, I don't know, 14th century Italy, but we find even examples from the 11th, 12th, or even earlier century Spain that had similar forms to that. So we can't know 
fully precisely what existed or didn't exist. But we have to cope with the fact that th there, w there was a lot of stuff around there that we, just because we don't have a direct evidence of doesn't matter that didn't exist. Um, it, th this is important not just for an antiquarian uh, for antiquarian sake but at the end of the day however it's what the broader equipment was was like by standard uh, speaking of arm and leg defenses it would also be very costly um, they pro male, long male sleeves and long skirted hauberks um, or splinted iron vambraces and greaves um, of the type found also in early medieval Scandinavian graves were present uh, male shows to protect legs and tigers uh, might have been a magyar derivation um, alongside probably with intensification of the use of stirrups because um, the, the stirrup is meant to have been I mean, at least the metal one in Europe by the Avars back in the, the 6th, 7th century um, so it would gradually you know, be adopted by other peoples in Europe the reason why this happened is not much the technology in itself but the fact that the, the increasingly um, collective oriented uh, cavalry tactics would require ever and ever more more stability on, on horseback and therefore when, when you charge straight into an enemy formation well that you needed stirrups. It's not because nobody had ever imagined them and the genius. It's just stirrups exist as long as there is that type of combat, right? So it's not much of an influence, you know, but that might have, you know, catalyzed at least the process. Um, and um, we know it because we find things like, I don't know, Langobard graves of little, little, I mean, baby girls that were told to, to go on horseback with. With, with 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 stirrup from, from even from previous times, so you understand that that is not just a military problem. Of course, stirrup is needed just to, to it, it's useful, right? It makes you more stable. Uh, here's the passage in Scradwell. I mean, even in on on the Bayeux tapestry, you see that not all Norman knights had stirrups at the time. So that speaks still for this gradual development that that was the 11th century. You can imagine by the the, the eight, the ninth, how the thing uh, still was. Um. We have evidence also from literary sources. For example, we know that the Frankish retinue of, the, of King Carloman's envoy Dodo that sacked the Lateran Palace in 769 was armed uh, only with spears, hmm? albeit some also wore mail. That would have been standard. Like um, an average foot, foot um, troop would be, you know, just in, in uh, for for the lesser part equipped with a, with armor. And as we were saying before, these might have, would have been regularly also the, the mounted warriors because, you know, you sacked the Lateran Palace, some would enter on horseback, let's presume, but others would dismount and, you know, figure like that. Um, and we, uh, we know that um, the spears had this large uh, horizontal lugs of wings beneath their blades. That is used normally not to make the, the blade uh, I mean the spear entering too much into the per into the enemy's body because it's freaking dangerous because it's not like in, in some movies that you know those guys get you know turn pierced and they die on the spot like normally you know a person can't go on for with 20 30 wounds M maybe even some mortal ones you know he's still going on fighting so when you you stick that spear into a person let, let let's leave aside the fact that just a few centimeters is enough to be lethal, but at, at the same moment, if, if 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 you keep pushing in, because human body is, is freaking you know soft, fragile, you know nothingness, and the, the the risk is the guy that it knows is gonna die at this point can't simply climb up over the spear and attack you and take you to the grave with him. Uh, so you want him to stay away. This doesn't just happen with animals, with hunting. For hunting reasons, like you know, attack a bear with like that, you want to keep it uh, at a distance. It, it happens with humans as well, and we uh, we also see long uh, long guts extending from the blade some way down the shaft, which means that that also entailed uh, chiefly an infantry uh, fencing in the sense that you know for cavalry combat that's pretty useless. Uh, or maybe can be, let's say, um, 
but um, let's say it makes it more more difficult. The idea is that these long guts were used to you know parry some some uh, sideways cuts uh, by by the enemy, right? The you know maybe it's human blade running down the shaft and hitting your hand. Well, it would be stopped by these long guts, right? And that is mostly for um, sure, not much for Couchet's style of lance play because that was just mostly about the impact. Surely, after the impact, you may, you know, be engaging to melee, and that could be. But let's say that that point would pass the sword more likely. So that probably reveals mostly an infantry uh, need to to fight with with this. And consider that also with swords, the now we'll see better what the deal was, but. Uh, th this, those were mostly cutting weapons, right? Uh, sword fighting being a matter of heavy blows with the edge of the blade, which had to be paired with the flat if a dented cutting edge or shattered blade was to, to be avoided. Um, and that was mostly what, for the sake of these elite troops we discussed today, would be the case, because that was kind of an essential prerogative, in a way. Um, but before swords, uh, a mansion is, is worth for um, the, the sex, you know, at this time, the, the throwing axe of Francisca had been uh, dismissed, let's say, and they, uh, the, the Franks would use a short sword or large dagger, right? We, this stuff existed since the migration era. It might have been a nomadic Asi Asiatic inspiration. It was similar to the contemporary Islamic Kanyar, for example. In Scandinavia, the Saks would um, assume kind of a sword form, right? Uh, there were also kind of um, of, uh, there was a, a variety of weapons. Like if you read some sagas, you find I don't know uh, things similar to 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 the to the Trajan room fire, for example. There were things like that, and there were were mostly for also for an armored combat. Because at the end of the day, those blades, you know, if you they cut through, they, they, if they hit against armor, they they ruin themselves. So, given that we're still talking about high middle ages, there was very few armor around, so chopping people down, you know, cutting them butcher, like in plain butcher would be normally. Um, and, however, these instead, much more compact, let's say, and big sometimes blades, like the sax, would also be useful sometimes to be stuck into, or massive, you know, uh, robust stuff to be stuck maybe in some to some you know opening in the armor right you know to even in that sense for an elite fighter to fight against another elite uh, fighter in an armored context so that would be useful um there were other forms like i don't know the longer birds sometimes had it had the longest scrum sex ever recorded up with a blade of up to 70 centimeters which is basically a saber right um, and it was plenty of stuff like that around, also in Frankish context. Um, as we were saying before, the most expensive weapon in absolute terms was the sword. Not surprisingly, it, its manufacture required the greatest of available technologies at the time, and was essentially a nobiliar weapon. It was uh, also a matter of status having one, knowing how to use it, because it required that uh, important training. Um, there was, let's say, the where there were there was a welding uh, maybe not properly maybe because well, okay we should make a video about that but let's say uh, these blades were made by twisting to, together rods of iron flattening uh, uh, I mean together flattening them softening uh, softening soldering them and and then grounding them down uh, this is the so-called pattern welding. And uh, it, it's not the same that was used, for example, in Damascus blades in the Middle East, um, nor the, the cast blades already being made in places like India, um, Central Asia. There were specific reasons. Now we, we don't have time to discuss. But uh, some pattern welded blades were, were harder, more carbonized. Um, uh, I mean, at more, with a more carbonized metal at the center than at their edges. Uh, in others, the reverse was true. Uh, and uh, we we don't know exactly whether this was intentional, right? Uh, these guys made swords that today, you know, the, this this metal, you know, for our engineering standards today, metallurgically speaking, were disgusting. I mean, they don't even fit in, in the category of, of, of steel. But what we can't do now after... 
modern uh, millennium of technology is to reproduce, you know, swords that would work so ergonomically well for being swords, that is for killing people, like they, they, they made them at the time. And for sure, for one masterpiece like that, there were other, like, I don't know, nine swords that had gone wrong, right? This was all, uh, of course, a pre-industrial uh, production system. Um, and it was all, uh, you know, the crafts, the secrets here, we, we don't know them. But there was a lot around this. We will make a video specifically on it. We don't even know whether pattern welded blades were stronger than those that were single forged, for example, at the time. So never think it's, again, it's about the t technology, but sometimes even just the availability and how, the, in war, what really works most of the time is the good enough. Right, always remember this. It's not having the best technology that will you conquer the world, make you conquer the world. Right? It's it's really what works for what you have to do. Um, and um, surely, uh, let's say for early medieval smiths, it would have been easier to make good quality slag-free iron in small strips. Um, it did require a lot of work. Like probably each you know finely made sword, two hundred man hours. Hmm? Um, and around two or three hundred weights of charcoal, right? And therefore, also, this makes you understand why these blades were kept uh, rust-free with very finely made um, uh, scabbards lined with oil-soaked uh, fur or, or hair. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, it was usually full, right? Other cover materials included leather, parchment, um, this, this cupboard was usually suspended from either the waist belt or baldric. As we were saying before, Carolingian archery is probably overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, it was of great importance, especially in certain frontiers, such like uh, such as the eastern one. Um, there were, I don't know, think about the Carolingians facing the, uh, the others. Um, that surely had, you know, sedentarized from the from two centuries now and had lost some kind but say the broader influences re received by the steps uh, were, were still there we know it uh, we know for example of uh, horse archers from the Abbey of Fulda you know that Fulda here was one of the most important centers in in, in, in in Germany I mean on the eastern or Frankish world, right? So um, Fulda is important. In the Middle Ages, I think in the 12th century, they arrived to have up to 20,000 armed men, allegedly. Uh, here we find horse archers, typically. Some say, well, okay, well, these wa were warriors that, you know, were archers that practically, mm, yeah, moved on horseback, but fought on foot, mostly. Well, I wouldn't just, I mean, it doesn't make much sense as a distinction. Right, surely they they weren't a, an identical copy of nomadic horse archers, but um, surely they could fight in, in both ways. But it's still meaningful to see how you know westwards, and not even so much considering Germany in that context, horse archery was 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 spread. Um, but there was also properly a European tradition of of of, of bows. For example, we know that in the eighth century. Uh, in Alamannia, th there were warriors equipped with longbows of view that were taller, taller than a man. Um, these weapons are obviously for foot soldiers, right? You can't use them on horseback because they're too big. Uh, and it tells you, like in other contexts, what it's obviously unknown, that is, the longbow was present all over Western Europe since prey history. And, however, the fact that we have a specific recording of these larger larger bows and men specifically you know were trained with them because it does require a lot of exercise as you know at an athletic level um, does speak for probably a specialization existing at the time therefore having archery designed not just for you know saturating yeah for saturation but for power right for uh, for for impact long bows in that sense could be also an important anti cavalry cavalry weapon this is interesting one could speculate that alamannia was a bit more of a conservative land compared to the rest of the carolingian empire they had been brutally repressed uh, by the same carolingians at some point they were f i mean the elites were f were obviously francicized but let's say that they were less um, nobilier and oligarchized than 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 um, than in Austria, in, um, in Austrasia, then Alamannia would be a bit more 
uh, reaction in some ways. Also, paganism at that point uh, still was was a thing in the land. Uh, but it's important because it tells you that probably also the broader, Fra- you know, broadly speaking, Frankish nobility was not a, you know, was acquainted with such weaponry, even longbows, and they would use it on foot. Importantly, um, surely uh, there was also the. Per- there were composites bows around, right, from from Roman times in general. We made a video on Byzantine um, uh, composite bow from the 6th century. Well, the Roman Empire had stretched over, over Western Europe still, especially after the, the Justinian's reconquest. So in places of the Carolingian Empire, such as Italy and southern France, you would still find probably this weaponry, but... Uh, this type of bow would be replaced eventually from the uh, short flat um, type of simple construction. We can think that for the sake of stability of horse archery, the Carolingians might have adopted wood frame saddle um, with a raised pommel from their other foes. Hmm? The Byzantines used the same, and they, um, you know, has, having been acquainted for, for a longer time with steppes peoples, and the thing in Central Europe would become m- definitely more spread chiefly by the 10th century because of Magyar uh, invasions. Speaking of training foot combat, I don't think we know excessively much. Like, we know in general that, given the world at the time, um, the, the warrior, by his status, knew, and not just him, um, I mean the nobleman, uh, not just the nobility, knew how to use weapons, right? Uh, an average peasant would, would know at least, you know, how to hunt as uh, part of his everyday life. It's not much, you know, you know the, that the standard would be being used to kind of raid and warfare, but not more than much at this point. Uh, the different areas of the Carolingian Empire were very different. Like, if you pick northern France, you already have, you know, the masses of the peasant gradually disarmed and, you know, subjected to the nobility. Places like Germany were still wild and the, the, the freemen had more power. Um, so these impor- the, this differences were important. Also, northern France or southern France deferred. Italy was definitely another thing, um, etc. Um, and there were also different styles of combat. Like if you take Brittany, you know, they had, we know they had still kind of even armored uh, horses, right? Probably from the tradition of the Alan Auxiliaries sa- settled in Armorica since late Roman times. I mean, there are a lot of um, the, um, the, the northern, uh, the, the Basques, for example, would be still fighting with tactics of very 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 resemblant to ones of ancient warfare there with you know hit and run skirmishes and so on um as we have seen in in the east uh towards the pannonian plain would be you know a lot of cavalry stuff going on uh etc so all these peoples contributed in a way um and uh however the no- you know the nobility is definitely the best documented uh, class concerning the their, their own training because also it was the highest uh, militarily speaking children of the noblemen would play with toy weapons who would be introduced to hard riding and hard living in general they we would go sand in this you know disruptive and reconstructive psychophysical experience that they would send uh, you know at, at, in the houses of other lords as a sort of patronage and the, the the level of sheer trauma, violence, and abuse was to to to, to create what what those men had to be for all their lives. The people that would butcher others without in the blink of an eye, without even you know thinking about it for for an entire lifetime. Right? If you if you don't pass through that the training, you you can't do it mentally speaking. So you start having that ferocious, violent, properly evil at certain levels, kind of training that was meant to function for for that for the specific warfare right consider here also these are not christian knights yet right the the carolingians are christians but in their very subjective way right you know sometimes they're actually closer much more fond of of the old testament and the military you know correspondence that would would find there that they were still between paganism and christianity at many levels of their lives of moral values that they they did 
have they didn't have reason to believe that the reason why they believed in God was that they would he would give them victory right and that was the only deal so our great problems of conscience didn't didn't quite exist maybe beginning that the meless starts uh, emerging right also morally from from this from this reality but for the rest it's probably one of the most unspeakably violent abusive and uh, and horrifying experiences you can ever imagine right and these are the people who do it firsthand right a peasant can can suffer that but can't do that you know a nobleman is trained exclusively to kill people and this is the, the most important point to get here um they would be mostly mounted warriors, as we've seen. So they they played uh, this, let's say, ancestors of tournaments that you can that date back to to, to the dawn of times, like right? those cultures, like um, old people's had at some point. But here the importance is that they become increasingly specialized for cavalry combat. Hmm. This thing existed also in other countries. For example, the Franks respected a big deal the Visigoths and the Longobards because they actually tributed to them. Still, at this point, even if it wasn't true anymore, you know, their primacy in mounted combat, as uh, East uh, Germans back from the migration era. Uh, but they already had their more organized, you know, um, I don't know, lance practice, for example, against a quintain, target, or a dummy. Uh, properly, I believe, tournaments against one another. So we can imagine that even if for foot combat, these guys would practice on a regular level, right? There were things like wrestling, like, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they include a broader psychophysical training, even with some poor weapons, for example, clubs. Uh, that was an even Roman legionnaires practice with that because it's very, you know, it's a matter of control of your mind, of your body, of calibrating, you know, dosing the the, 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 the energies gradually. So this would be part of a, of a life uh, long training. Mm -hmm. There were uh, war games properly. Uh, the sources call it causa exercizi, that is, you know, properly for training, uh, with equal forces um, uh, that would be mixed also with distinctive ethnic or tribal backgrounds, right? Where practices also in warfare would be the ones of brotherhoods, of, they were typically of, of pagan background, like drinking each other's blood as, a, as kindred uh, in arms, let's say, but more, like even more pagan stuff with, you know, animals, even... I mean, consider up to the seventh century. We know the, the the Christian Franks still did human sacrifices, right? In, in, in the wake of their pagan, and, and this thirst of blood. I mean, the the, the minds. It's very, you know. It, it, of course, the most difficult thing here is to 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 get into the mindset of an eighth century Carolingian comics, which is something we cannot do. But it, it probably the single most important thing to do in every in military history is try to make at least an effort to understand what it means for these people to leave. And, and to do what they do, right? So uh, Charlemagne was obsessed with David, with you know, the the the, the Lord, right? The God Lord of Armies, right? And and the idea of seeing their, their enemies crushed, you know. And there is also kind of also the myth. Think about the massacre of Verdun, right? Everybody says, ah, oh, a terrible thing. It, they everybody did the same exact thing all over the world. Um, and uh, the, the point there is that the Franks themselves wanted, for those times, moral standards to emphasize the bloodshed because it, 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 it was a form of propaganda. It is to say to all the other peoples of the empire, look what happens to you if you don't. It, probably that battle of blood didn't quite happen. Probably behaved just some, you know, an important am amount of, of rebel chieftains, but, you know, things are, you know, a bit mythicized. If, and everybody who knows the sources of that period knows how stories work. These are stories, they're not. Okay, we don't have certainties on what things kind of happen. Of course, war was as um, violent as you can imagine in every way, right? But consider, once again, everybody did it the same. I mean, the Saxons weren't just a pure, noble, free, uh, uh, you know, uh, that were annihilated by the terrible Franks that wanted to. Those were... You know, they had been raiding Francia on a regular base ever since, you know, the 7th century. And it was always back and forth, right? Did for that. Um, so we we should get rid of any kind of, you know, easy moral standard where when we look at, you know, these people were crazy. First of all, they, they weren't even that different. Like, do you think a, a Frank or a Saxon were actually different people? Look at their laws. Uh, look at their beliefs, right? Uh, the, the sharp divide between the two is a myth, 
and it, it's a myth that is inflated by the same Carolingian propaganda. That it's kind of sad. I mean, it speaks beautifully in favor of it, but it's kind of sad that people in the 21st century cannot distinguish, you know, <laughs> the 8th century beautiful propaganda from from historical reality. But that speaks, you know, for how people today are radically ignorant and undereducated, and how you know clever people. Were, were at the time compared to them simply because they were pressured in a way that we can't even imagine fortunately anymore but it's still not an excuse for our shortcomings that are disgusting to say the least um, and so individual training of these guys would go from puberty uh, with already javelin, bow and sword right so imagine from your from, from your early teens you're already being acquainted with, with a full panoply here, and we um, we th there was a an important physical exercise. Some would be crushed by this. They would be bullied. They would be abused. And uh, it was the as we've seen the wall thing because it was m meant to make them grow with a with a skin thick as you know the one of fifty elephants. I <laughs> say uh, to perform as we were saying that the the most unspeakable atrocities we were talking about, like every professional of war. And uh, and they worked because they they conquered a freaking half of Europe like that, and um, they the, there are comparable trainings at the same time though, and that speaks for the substantial homogeneity of pre-industrial societies at that level of development in Europe and the Mediterranean, in Constantinople, in uh, Islam, right? There, there was the same thing. There was a lot of also in this proto-chivalric um, reality that was emerging a bit everywhere, right? Uh, the the Franks would have it more in the sense that among these, you know, the Byzantines and the Muslims were a bit more statal oriented. The, the Franks were more, as we've seen, private. So they were of 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 the three, definitely the properly feudal or at least emergingly as feudal power that would have the the heaviest, you know, chivalric character, nature, ethos. Like at least, you know, certain areas of Islam were were similar. Like especially Persia, that was, you know an early feudal reality, right? And and even the Byzantines didn't kid, honestly, because the oligarchies, especially of the city, that were they were starting to become some ex ex excellently trained like that. The Byzantines were masters in copying, given their status or resources, you know, properly certain artificially in a sense, certain ethnic uh, styles of combat, not just because they literally hired the same people as mercenaries, but because they would be able to replicate them as well. Um, we don't have much knowledge how training actually uh, happened, right? Uh, you know, this thing stemmed from tribal war games of of ancient times, easily. Um, but in 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 the Carolingian world, we see for political reasons things like the, the March field. Um, uh, military reviews happening. That is, you know, in the early eighth century, the, 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 it emerges this practice because of the uh, habituality of this ever longer range and larger military expeditions to gather on the field of uh, of March. Uh, that uh, would, w w which actually took place in in May. Because in northern France it was in May, right? You know, in southern Europe it was in in March actually, because it was the weather was milder. But the important here is that they, um, and, and the difference is interesting because, for example, when the Carolingians conquered Italy, they had they they held that in March in Italy, right? And while in France they held it in May. But aside from that, um, the, the whole point of that was not just to gather forces for strategic reasons in order to eventually launch the expedition from there. Uh, certain forces actually flowed from different areas without gathering, but the, the March field was, let's say, a political test to see um, how many nobles of the empire would gather. But also it was an occasion to train there, because when they, they arrived and they didn't know how to do it, they, they simply would start playing, like making these tournaments, with making this collective training, they would start making maneuvers, so to get themselves acquainted to operate on a larger scale. With other peoples didn't do that, right, at least in the surroundings, and that's why they were military in fear, because as always, it's collective training that makes a difference. It's not how you are, how individually skilled you are, right? Here, I don't know, a Saxon, uh, a Basque, uh, a Longobard, a Naber, uh, 
even an Anglo-Saxon chieftain uh, would have the same level of individual training, but they wouldn't have the same level of collective training. And that's why they were conquered by the, the Franks. Uh, now, you know, it's not a simplistic explanation. There were other reasons. I mean, the Franks, here, I didn't stress the fact that they were huge. Like, at this point, it's a really an empire, even if it was just because um, resources were enormous. There was no other power to control so much, especially from Neustria, all over this Teilreich uh, that surrounded the uh, the uh, Neustria and Austrasia, right, all around. And other powers were smaller, like even the other Kaganate or Saxony or, or Italy or... Um, uh, they, they they were simply smaller chunks, right? So even uh, that, it, it doesn't much speak about their the, the military policy of the individuals, but of the political unity that wasn't so great as for 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 those political, even random factors in, in Francia, right? As we were saying before, if a Carolingian Empire existed, it's because um, Carloman died and Charlemagne could finally reunite both stuff so uh, these are things that really marked our history deeply but very deeply and and we can go as far as saying yes actually Frankish superiority was start being felt from a qualitative point of view in this element of the army the elite but still that I mean the rest of the army was pretty much similar to others and that it was just the broader massive logistical capabilities would would bring to and this predatory, imperialistic, expansionistic uh, addis that would make the, the, those victories possible, right? Because otherwise it wasn't a dramatic difference in, that, in those times and places between way, you know, in ways of making war, right? And um, this is pretty much it. We don't know much of discipline. I mean, um, still, I guess this, this was based um, on a mix of probably appearing kind of I don't know, there was surely signaling there was somebody in charge for, of the broader of the broader unity, right, of, of the army, etc. But still the you know, the, the bonds were based on you know obedience was based on, on the cli the clientary bonds mostly. That ha it happened at this point in a higher level, right? The, the Carolingian court was the place where these things happened. Uh, 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 up to the time of Charlemagne, let's say everything w w that carried out larger conquests so was able to reward more people, right? Uh, there was a greater meritocracy than later on, right? That's where properly the Carolingian elite was created. The people rose from even, you know, nothingness, literally, into because they were go good warriors, right? And that were preferred, naturally, by the Carolingians as well because they were the new comers that would counter the, let's say, more traditional oligarchy that would instead try not to make the empire, you know, centralized too much. Mm -hmm. And surely this boosted morale because, you know, continued uh, recorded success uh, from the opportunity of, for personal uh, of advancement offered definitely a lot for an 8th century franc. So participating to this expedition was a way of social promotion, political promotion, there was still surely in some cases ethnic or tribal solidarity that contributed to the phenomenon um, and um, surely there were also areas that would be more militarized than others famously the marches right that um, eventually had all different stories but I mean you know if you lived on the frontier right it's not a it's not a chance that, that the empire would be renewed in the 8th century by the Saxons, that paradoxically, you know, are some of the greatest success of Carolingian conquest in the sense they they were the ones that, uh, at the end of the day, managed to to absorb the most that kind of um, imperial grandeur, military organization. Why? Because they were constantly on the hottest frontier with the Slavs, and it was also way way more unstable. and And so it's a bit like the Carolingians in the fact that they were probably more warlike in a sense because they came from Austrasia on the eastern frontier with the Saxons. Um, so yes, there is the, the, sometimes this range action of properly militarily skilled um, communities that manage to, to reinforce the, the structure of the empire, right? Whereas, um, however, the system was to, you know, eventually cool off by having concentrated many resources in, in the hands of these conquerors and then that would eventually start trying to build a state very, very, very gradually. Um, surely there were some, uh, you know, uh, 
th there was some religious motivation uh, after battle the, the Franks chanted gradual psalms for the fall and gave the last rites um, there was a sense of re Christian religiosity of course existing uh, you know undoubtedly as a probably also as a primary one it's, aside from how much they understood of it but, but surely over the, the, the pagan substratum that still had something to say even in these realities um, the clergy had a very important value in this sense from a moral point of view um, and the clergy did participate to the army to consider this the fact that uh, the all the secular and ecclesiastical princes were called to fight uh, or at least to uh, because they would do it anyway even if they were clergymen but the clergyman were at least required to to lead his contingent up to the frontier. Eventually, he could come back. But many would fight, right? Uh, some of the greatest, uh, I mean, even some Charlemagne's nephew were, yeah, abbots, bishop, military men, dying battle against I don't know the Vikings and so on. So, uh, these were men of war that didn't quite distinguish. We made videos about this, uh, you know secular life from religious from ecclesiastical life it was all one they were the same and that's a per fact characteristic also of certain areas of central europe and beyond where bishops would take their weapons and fight because um, it's false the, the the thing that you know also of the mace that they couldn't shed blood it's it's all a misunderstanding it's like one quote i don't know in the in the low middle ages and now it became universal no most of them wouldn't give a damn especially in these earlier times, where literally they were the same people, right? Some were trained maybe as to become military men, but would eventually, uh, or vice versa, you know, that, but they, they still came from the same people that fought and car uh, that had that kind of lifestyle in the first place, and their powers uh, as senior or uh, territorial lords would be essentially the same the, as, as clergymen, as the secular ones. Um, so, okay, today we didn't talk very much about the actual topic, that is to say, what is a heavy infantryman like him doing, right? Um, I can just add that, of course, you, you can understand what would be the situations in which um, um, a cavalryman would dismount to fight on difficult terrain and swamps. Consider, Think about what was Europe at the time, full of forests still, so especially in this um, Central European reality. Um, and so it, it was practical and useful to fight like that. They would find enemies that would fight in the same way, or even troops that were used, you know, ethnic contingents under their own control would fight in the same way. It was totally normal, right? It's just like, I don't know, at Norman's times, most of the heavy infantry you see there, basically they are the same dismounted uh, knights. Here it's basically the same, albeit we can say that probably, given that cavalry was, you know, was not so you know intensively developed yet was beginning to distinguish itself in a more professional sense just under Carolingian times um, infantry that truly made the bulk you know the numerical bulk but not probably already these the 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 strength bulk of the of the army um, and even here there there is a huge debate honestly I would like to to go in depth to that because it's here cavalry still wasn't dominating the battlefields right it was starting in certain political and social realities, but it was beginning just now to expand from, from the core of the Frankish lands like that, uh, because of the disarming of the freemen, because of, you know, this increasingly aristocratic, uh, aristocratized, uh, 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 you understand what I mean, reality. But, like, it, it's obvious that in contingents of, ta uh, of thousands, sometimes even maybe tens of thousands of, of, of infantrymen, uh, well, some of them would be heavily equipped and would normally fight on foot like that so we can't be so yes it is true that Carolingian sources uh, of recruitment stress the fact that you know if you were as we've seen for the same price of the armor was superior to one of a horse so whoever had an armor that kind would normally have a horse and know how to fight on it but still the cases you would see heavy infantry operating normally on the field probably were higher than we think um, and and it would have been a, a viable option considering the same strength of infantry altogether, right? Also, not the heavily armored one, considering the, the, those time standards, especially in Western Europe. So, uh, this is extremely important to stress, right? That, that there is definitely an equestrian ethos uh, 
permeating all European society at this point, individualistically speaking, but the practice of warfare is something else. Infantry still has its own saying. Right, um, you don't have to look at the Battle of Zunta, where you know the Carolingian cavalry was, you know, probably miscarried uh, in the first place, and then it, it infringed against the, the Saxon infantry. It's, by the way, the only tactical reconstructable battle of the Carolingian times, because for the rest we know zero about how battles fought, because they didn't care to explain us. They, they, it was just about who was right or wrong in God's eyes, you know, um, and on those, you know, on whom felt saying God's favor. Uh, and it, it's it, it's fascinating because the same uh, the same sometimes most of the elders, as you understand at the time, were clergymen, and we have even clergymen that were participating to those battles would write. So they were warriors themselves. They, they would they wouldn't tell us how it was because obviously they knew, um, and they would just say it's because of God. And, and I would tell you it's more important that even the frustration of the realization that we don't know. Uh, that is the fact that they could have told us, right, the literate ones, and and they wouldn't care. How, however, it's much better for us to understand what that was, what, what was actually about, than mentally speaking, than it would be if these guys had been us, or so twenty first century people trying to answer our own questions. But we have to listen to what they wanted us to know, because that's the answer, and the best answer we we would probably ever get. Uh, about their mindset, and of course we have to talk about the Carolingians because Carolingians uh, marked the world definitely, even unwillingly in a sense. I mean, in part not, but let's say they they, trans- they they transformed Europe in a deep way, right? Other peoples didn't quite achieve that change. Like we made a video about that. Uh, the caliphs didn't alter significantly the local realities. They didn't make it to make it flourish into something else. Also, the Byzantines had their their, their rise at some point. What the Franks triggered, doesn't matter how slow and ineffective for a long time was, in a sense, on another. Maybe not ineffective, I wouldn't say so much, but surely um, the Latin Germanic structures took a lot before taking off compared, I don't know, to the, to the Caliphate of Cordoba or to, to Constant, to the Byzantine Roman Empire. But surely on the long run they had a much more dramatic impact at a deep, at the root level, right, to what we would think of as the Western civilization today, then, then they could even probably even expect themselves. I mean, they they weren't fully aware of it, but they they still triggered a change that um, that is not to be that I personally haven't found anywhere else, historically speaking, in uh, at least for for those kind of political and social standards like it could be at this time the 9th, 10th century so it's very very important anyhow uh, too much said actually uh, we will come back again and again on these topics sorry if it's a mess as usual I don't explain every single thing I say but I already made those videos on Carolingian history there are a lot and they're worth a listen if you're interested in this specific topics and I tried to mix everything up a bit for the inferred for thought for now, we stop here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.